Open your Bibles tonight to uh, John's Gospel, the first chapter. Now we're going to talk about tonight the power of the spoken word. The power of the spoken word. It's important that we understand these things. You know, Jesus said it this way. He said, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked and taketh away that which was sown in their hearts. Now, if you read Mark's account of it only, Mark said, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, Satan comes immediately to take away that which was sown in the heart. Well, now, if, if that was the whole truth, then there wouldn't be much need of hearing it, would it? That Satan just going to steal it. That's why we should read all the Gospels. You see, one writer would catch something the other didn't catch. In, in places, Mark catches things that Matthew didn't catch. And uh, when you get the view from every side, you get the whole, the whole Word of God, you see. And uh, so Jesus came along, and, and Matthew recorded, I mean, Jesus, they were both hearing Jesus, but one of them heard it one way, and he wrote it down one way, and the other and remembered something else. He said, when anyone heareth the Word of the kingdom and understandeth it not. Now, that's a key phrase. And sometimes that's a missing link. If people don't understand the Word, if they don't understand the Word of the kingdom, then not only will the wicked one talk you out of it, some well-meaning church members will talk you out of it. And, and you know, if you, if, if you get enough people saying, oh, well, Brother so-and-so tried that, and then, you know, he died with an growing toenail or something about his dumb. <laughs> Well, I learned a long time ago that, that you never take experience over the Word of God. It's always a dangerous thing. Uh, and, and quite often you will hear people say things like this, well, now I know the Bible says that, but now here's what happened to me, or here's what happened to Brother So-and-so. Now, what are they doing? They're casting out the Word in, because of some experience either they had or someone else had. And you see, that gets people off the Word. So that's why Jesus said it the way He did, and Matthew caught it. If he understandeth it not, then somebody's going to talk him out of it. And it might be some well-meaning church member that just didn't understand the, the principles of the, of the Bible. Now, now, we talked about last night in the service the fact that God, the way God taught Abraham faith was that he eventually had to change his name to get Abram, Abram, Abram to say, well, actually didn't, never did get Abram to say what God said. He changed his name to Abraham to get Abraham to say what God said in his word. The scripture said of Abram, he believed in the Lord. But the Scripture says in the New Testament that Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, how do you tell the difference in a person that believes in the Lord and one that believes what God said? Because they will say what God said, and they will unashamedly pronounce what God said about them and proclaim it whether it is evident outwardly or not. It, it's called the principle of calling things that are not as though they were. You that were here last night, you remember we read in Romans, the fourth chapter, where it says, God who quickeneth the dead and calleth things that are not as though they were. Talking about how he taught Abraham faith. He called the thing that was not as though it was until it was. But he had to have Abraham's cooperation to cause it to come to pass. I'm convinced if he hadn't changed Abram's, Abram's name to Abraham, he'd have had to find him another man. But because God's word was out, he had to deal with the situation the way it was. Now, you, you'll realize that Abram did not go around saying, I'm not old, no, I'm not old, I'm not old, no, I'm not old, and my wife is not barren. No, he didn't do that. See, there's no power in denying what exists. 
Now, in the early 70s, when the Word of Faith was taught throughout this nation uh, as never before, sometimes people misunderstood because there was so much emphasis put on whosoever shall say and saying and saying and saying. There was so much emphasis put on that. But really, you can't put too much emphasis on that. They just simply uh, got hung up on that part of it because uh, if, if you study Mark eleven twenty three, 23, you know, it says, Whosoever shall say, believe, doubt not his heart, believe what he's saying will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So it says, say three times in there and believe once. And like Brother Hagin says, you have to do three times as much teaching on the saying as you do believing. But yet people got the idea, well, all you have to do is say it. No, there's a lot more to it than saying it. But yet saying it is involved in causing it to work. But, but people got the idea, well, all you have to do is say it. You just say it a few times and it'll come pass. Like one fellow told uh, Brother Happy Caldwell, he was out on the West Coast several years ago, and this fellow said, "Why, well, Brother Caldwell, this faith and confession stuff doesn't work. He said, well, oh, why do you say that? Well, he said, I said 300 times in one day I had a new car, but I didn't get it. A whole day he said it. But didn't get it. See, all he had was the, the formula. He didn't have the principle. See, we, we talked about last night in the other service uh, about the law of faith. The law of faith is a law of God. I call it the law of change. And it's connected with words. The reason it's connected with words is because faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing God's Word. The Apostle Paul talked about it in Romans, the 10th chapter. He talked about the righteousness which is of faith, says. He tells you what it would say. He said, the Word is nigh you, or as close to you, as getting, in your, getting it in your mouth and speaking it into your heart. And that's the way you transfer the Word of God from the pages of this book into your heart, into the, the, the core of your being where it'll work for you. And that's what Jesus talking about when He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. If the Word abides in you, you'll not be saying, well, I know the Bible says that, but now here's, here's what happened to me. No. You're going to say the Word didn't change regardless of what happened to me because the Word works. The power of the spoken word is a tremendous thing in the scriptures. And uh, let's read from John here. I could spend all night introducing the subject, but let's get into it. St. John chapter 1, or Big, Big John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things, you ought to underline that, all things were made by Him. Him who? Him, the Word. You see, in other writings of the Apostle Paul, uh, he, he talks about uh, he was the creator. Jesus, the Word, was the creator of all things. He was the creator. He was the Word personified. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not, or prevailed not against it. You see, darkness never prevails over light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of that light, and all men through him might believe. He was not that light, was sent to bear witness of the light, that the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world. The world was made by him. Now notice, by him who? Jesus, the Word. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now, if you study these scriptures, you'll notice it refers to Jesus and the Word as one, and one with God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. I get amused sometimes at the faith critics. They'll say things like, well, now these faith folks think that, that uh, the Word is God. Try to make the Word God. 
Why in the world do we want to do that? It's already that way. Isn't that what it said here? The Word is God over every situation. God's Word is the final authority on any subject. Now, whether you believe it or don't believe it, it is still the final authority. And whether you act on it or don't act on it, it still is a workable system of the kingdom, and it is the law of change, the law of faith. I call it the law of change. If you're going to change something, you're going to change it this way. And I say, you change it this way. It, it comes through the Word of God. It comes by being obedient to what God said. But you can change situations and circumstances by the spoken Word of God. So now, now he comes on down to, to verse uh, 13. says, which was born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the personification of God's Word. He came to this planet with a physical flesh, blood, and bone body to show you what God's Word could do in physical flesh form. Now, when we understand that He is one and synonymous with the Word of God, Let's go over to the, uh, Genesis, the first chapter. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the deep, face of the deep. Now, the word without in verse 2 if you study it out, it is translated nearly always or most of the time. Made, uh, let's see, the earth was without form and void. The earth was not created void. It was made void. Now, that's, that's very obvious. Now, let me show you something, and I did, really didn't mean to get on to it, but we're just going to follow the Holy Ghost. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you come down here a little ways, and you, you find that God says that He called the dry land earth. Now, in verse 2, it's, it's uh, covered with water. He called the dry land earth. Up here in verse 1, it says, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, there was a catastrophic event between verse 1 and verse 2 that made the earth void, without form, and covered with water. It wasn't Noah's flood. It was, we could call it Lucifer's flood. But see, God called the dry land earth. And if he created the earth, it was dry land. But here it's covered with water. Now, that'll help you understand the fact that the earth is probably could be millions of years old, but it had a facelift about 6,000 years ago. What you read here is the recreation formation of the earth because he said, uh, replenish the earth. I didn't really intend to get on that, but that'll help you understand that science, true science and the Bible are not contrary to one another. But there's a lot of people that get the idea, well, the earth is only 6,000 years old. Well, there's other scriptures in, in the Old Testament that reveals it's much older than that. When, when Satan showed up in the Garden of Eden, he had already ruled over nations and had been cast out of heaven. He had to borrow the body of a serpent to manifest himself to Eve. But that's not the point I really came here to do. Here's what I came to. <laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, he looked out and saw darkness, and he said, let there be light. You only get three verses into Genesis until you see God calling things that are not. You call for what's not there. Now, how did he do that? With words, the spoken word. God said... Now notice verse, verse 4. 
And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. Every time in every day you find God said, and God said, and God saw. Now, if God saw after he said, and we're created in the image of God, it tells you something. The way you can see yourself with the promise of God is by saying what the promise says. It creates an image. There's creative power in the spoken Word of God. Now, notice here that uh, in verse 4 it says, And God saw. We come down in, uh, in the second day, and it tells you that God said, Let there be a firmament, and so on, verse 6. And then you come down to, to verse uh, 10, says, God called the dry land earth, and together and together the waters called the sea, and God saw that it was good. God said, and God saw. 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 And if you'll say, you'll see. This is God's M.O. This is his method of operation. He released his faith in words. He used his words as containers to transport his faith out into the vast darkness, and he called light out of darkness. Now somebody said, well, now I can understand that, Brother Caps, because you see, he's God. Well, maybe you can understand this then. Come over here to verse 26. Let us, God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl there, over the cattle, over, every, uh, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Let us make men in our image, our likeness. Let them have dominion. Now, let me ask you, how are them going to have dominion? Same way that him had dominion. Now, I know that's not good English, but it'll help you understand it. <laughs> Through the spoken word, now I'm talking about, that, that don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm talking about speaking in line with God's word of promise. Let them have dominion. The Lord said to me one time, he said, son, he said, you've been, <laughs> I mean, uh, he caught me, boy, right where I was. <laughs> he said, you've been so spiritually illiterate, I couldn't talk to you intelligently. He said, you've been indoctrinated. And, you know, T.L. Osborne said one time in a meeting, I'll never forget it. He said, when people get indoctrinated, they quit thinking. And you know that's true? They just accept what their doctrine says. They didn't set it out in the Word. And I had a lady write me uh, several years ago. I was on a radio station, went on a radio station in Memphis. I went on radio in 1977. And uh, this lady said, she wrote me a letter. She said, Brother Caps, I got so, you got me so stirred up one morning, I was going to work. And, and she said, that can't be right. I'm going home after work and get my Bible and prove him wrong. She said, my God, I found out they'd been lying to me for 40 years in my church. <laughs> well, they wasn't really lying. They'd been indoctrinated and they quit thinking. And they was blaming God for everything that happens. Well, it's God's will if it happens to you. No. <clears throat> now, here he says, God said... Let us make man in our image. Let them have dominion. So God created man in his own image. The image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, how did he create? In his own image. Now, what did he do? And God blessed them. And he said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl there, and so on. The Lord said to me uh, when he was talking to me about it, he said, what you need to do, son, is, is forget everything religious you ever heard about this book, the Bible, and go back and read it like you never heard it before. And I just thought, well, I'm starting Genesis. And I got here to where it said I had dominion over the fish of the sea. I said, glory to God, I'll catch more fish now. I ne it never occurred to me that I had dominion over fish. My dad could catch five fish to my one, and in fact, sometimes he'd catch a lot more than that. 
And uh, I started saying, I have dominion. I wouldn't dare fish a lake without taking dominion over the fish. And uh, <clears throat> it changed, uh, and, and it works. <clears throat> I, got, I had the fish in the freezer to prove it. <laughs> I better not get started telling fish stories. Though. <clears throat> But now here, when you get down to verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning with the sixth day. God said and God saw. Every day God said, every day God saw. And somebody said, well, now I just can't see this healing business. Then you're not talking about it. You're not quoting healing scriptures. Because if, you, if the spoken word comes out of your mouth, it will get into your heart. The word is nigh you, Paul said. It's in your mouth and in your heart. First, it's in your mouth. Then it gets in your heart. Now, don't misunderstand you. You get some faith from hearing somebody else say what the word said, but it comes more quickly if you're speaking it out of your voice. So here we have a classic example in Genesis 1 that God has given man domin mankind dominion over this planet but there's no authority exercise, there's no dominion exercise without words. The centurion came to Jesus in, in the eighth chapter of Matthew. He said, his servant lies home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said, I'll come healing. Oh, no, he said, you don't have to come to my house, just speak the word only, my servant will be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this man, go, and he goeth, to another come, and he cometh to do this, and he doeth it. Here's a man that understood authority, and he understood that if Jesus said the word, his servant would be healed. He said, speak the word only, my servant will be healed. Here's a man that Jesus just stopped and preached a sermon. He said, this is the greatest faith I've ever found in all of Israel. Now, I asked the Lord one time, I said, why did this man have greater faith than all the covenant people? Now, he is a Roman centurion. <clears throat> this man did not even come under the covenant at that point. But Jesus said he had the greatest faith he'd ever seen. <clears throat> now, the reason speakers have to have water, it keeps the sermon from being dry. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> Somebody said, drink more. <clears throat> <clears throat> Jesus preached him a sermon. He said, this is the greatest faith I've ever found in all of Israel. And I asked the Lord, Lord, why did this man have greater faith? And he didn't even come out of the covenant at that point. The gospel was the Jew first, then to the Gentile. He said, the man tells you out of his own mouth. He said, I'm a man under authority. You have to be under authority to have authority. He said, speak the word. This man released his faith at my word. He was fully persuaded if Jesus spoke the word, he knew Jesus had authority over sickness and disease. If he speaks the word, it's settled. The man didn't try to believe. He wasn't believing he would believe. He had released his faith to that point. It was, he had used his faith to the limit. It was settled as far as he was concerned. He was fully persuaded, if Jesus speaks the word, my servant will be healed. Now, just ask yourself, if Kenneth Copeland came to town or Oral Roberts or some uh, evangelist that you had great confidence in and, and you had somebody that was sick, would you say, oh, no, we don't have to go pray for him, just speak the word? See, this man said, if you speak the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, Go thy way, as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. As, as he is going to believe? No. He said, As you have believed. Past tense. He had already released his faith to a point of contact. And that point of contact was, If Jesus speaks the word, my servants heal. He was fully persuaded of that. And that's exactly what happened. His servant was healed the self-same hour. 
I appreciate you joining us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. You know, when it comes to sowing seed and reaping and harvest, Jesus gives us the parable in Mark chapter 4 that is a parable of all parables revealing how the kingdom of God works. Our offer today is offer number 2237. It's called the Dominion Principle. Two audio cassettes in an album for $12 plus $4 postage and handling. Uh, the dominion principle. What does that mean? The seed always has dominion over the soil. Now, if you don't understand that, you're going to be crippled in the ability to sow the seed and reap a harvest because uh, Jesus would take natural things in one hand and show you how spiritual things work. He shows you how the kingdom of God works. This is called the parable of all parables. If you don't understand this parable, how will you understand all parables? The sower sows the Word. The Word is the Word of God. Where is it sown? In the heart of man. And uh, it produces. So it's uh, offer number. 2237, the Dominion Principle. Now, I farmed for 29 years before I uh, went into the ministry, and I never did plant soybeans and have the ground say, no, we're not raising soybeans. We're going to raise cucumbers and bananas. No, it can't because the seed always has dominion over the soil. The soil never has dominion over the seed. If you keep God's Word in your mouth and plant the Word of God daily by confessing the Word of God, it will change your life, and it will bring you a harvest of the promises of God in your life. We have a toll-free auto line. It's 1-877-396-9400, 1-877-396-9400. Two audio cassettes in an album for $12 plus $4 postage and handling. And I believe this series will be a blessing to you. It gives you understanding of how your seed that you plant, the Word of God, is works to produce, and it has dominion over the soil of your heart, and it'll cause it to come forth. Until tomorrow, the next time, this is Charles Capps reminding you that the enemy is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus is coming soon. We are glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. To order the product offered on today's program, send your check or money order to Charles Capps Ministries. Or to place your order on Visa or MasterCard, call 1-877-396-9400. For more information about Charles Capps Ministries or for a schedule of meetings, write to Charles Capps Ministries, P.O. Box 69, England, Arkansas, 72046. This broadcast has been sponsored by Charles Capps Ministries and our partners in this area.